It's not hard at all to go find a project anywhere, really. I mean, you can find anything and you can talk it up and make it look good. But I'm talking about a project where you can come in and start up the drill rig and produce solid results with the drilling time after time after time. And we've done that. These breccia pipes and putting out some of the, the grades and the long runs of, of mineralization in the, in the drill core, uh, people got really excited. Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thanks so much for watching the video. If you like it, give us a thumbs up at the end and do leave your comments below. It helps us understand the sorts of questions you'd like us to be asking, how you think we did, and of course, what you thought of the company. And of course, you can catch this as a podcast or read about it in an article or transcription on cruxinvestor.com. And for our Crux Club members, you get early access to this video. And if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to David Kelly, CEO of Chicana Copper. Uh, they're also hunting gold and silver in Peru. Existing shareholders are slightly frustrated by the length of time uh, the permitting has taken. However, with that possibly four to six weeks away, um, new shareholders might look at this slightly differently. Um, we talked to David about some of the technical components to the project, why they're excited about these breccia pipes with possible porphyry sitting underneath. Um, and we look at some of the other things that they are planning to do this year, including 15,000 meters of additional drilling. They have the cash to do that. In fact, they have the cash to go well into next year. So lots discussed. Take a look in the description below at some of the topics. Anything interesting in particular, like permitting, you can click on the number beside that topic and that's called a timestamp and I'll jump you to that part of the video. But enjoy what David has to say. David, how are you doing, sir? I'm great. Thank you. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, another news story for uh, our viewers and followers, subscribers. Um, you're going to tell us today about uh, Chicane Chicana. I nearly said it the Canadian way, right? Um, so where are you today? You're speaking from uh, Canada? I'm from my home in Denver, Colorado. You're down in Denver. Okay. How are things there? All good? Yeah, we're doing all right. You know, we're, we're handling the situation as best we can and, and coping, but uh, we're, you know, we're doing pretty good with the numbers. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, fantastic. Well, look, um, why don't we kick off with that one minute overview of the business, then we can pick it up from there. Yeah, okay. So we're exploring a project in, in uh, central Peru. It's a Soledad project. It's our sole asset. And we're at what I would call the advanced exploration stage. We've drilled 30,000 meters on this project. We're heading towards the first maiden resource on the project after this next 15,000 meters of drilling that we already have planned and fully funded we will go into resource estimation uh studies and then that will be published so we're on well on the path to getting to where we want it to be uh, there has been delays uh, since the start mostly uh, related to permits and we can talk about that but our business strategy is to develop a project that's take the project to the point that it's ready to be developed, it's been de-risked, and then find a developer to come in and purchase the asset or the company and develop it into a mine. Okay, great. Like that helps position the type of company you are. Um, I'm going to start with the share price, right? So it's been a sort of gradual decline over the last year. I mean, I do mean gradual decline over the last year, but the past two, two and a half years, you've come off a peak of about two bucks and sort of steadily down. Was that just excitement uh, back in 2017 or what, what was that big peak? Yeah, I think there was a lot of initial excitement. I mean, part of the story here is that we're exploring tourmaline breccia pipes and it's it's a new exciting geologic story. We have considerable expertise in tourmaline breccia pipes. So a lot of people were really excited about that. And then we, we, when we started drilling these breccia pipes and putting out some of the, the grades and the long runs of, of mineralization in the, in the drill core, uh, people got really excited. So that that was what created the you know the the run up. Uh, part of our our share structure uh, early on, there was quite a bit of an overhang in, in in early financing stock that came into the company, and that's since been cleared out through escrow agreements. So part of that explains that. I would say just the overall market has been you know part of the part of the problem as well but a big part of it too is delays in permits that we ran into in peru and peru is somewhat notorious for delays and in, in, in the permitting process it's a very bureaucratic paper driven type of process and you know we we certainly were subjected to that and i think part of the 
the frustration to some of the uh, investors was just the, the delays. But, you know, we're well on our way to getting that permit now and things are looking really good. Yeah, sometimes it's it's uh, not positive if you have too fast a start, isn't it? People's expectations yeah. just a little bit too, too much and a little bit unrealistic. But okay, um, you've given us some clues there, but I've got to ask the question. I'm trying to understand the mindset of the management team always, especially when I've not met them before, I don't have a relationship with them, is, you know, how long have you been in this? What did you initially set out to try and do? And do you think you've been able to do that or have you had to, you know, change along the way? Well, our strategy has been set from day one, and that, that was to not be a project generator and have multiple projects in a portfolio and try to find other people to spend money on our projects. Our goal was to, to go out and apply the skills that we have as a management team and pick the very, very best project that we could get our hands on, and that for us was the Soledad project. And I had, you know, I spent 25 years in you know, in and out of Latin America. I already had been to this particular project back in 2011, and it was a really, really attractive project from a number of standpoints. Our, you know, focus was to pull together the team that had the expertise to operate in Peru, also the expertise uh, to explore these unique type of uh, mineral deposits, terminally breccia pipes. And our, our chairman is a gentleman named Doug Kerwin. He's a very well-known Australian geologist, very successful discovery track record. And Doug is a world-renowned expert in these types of terminally breccia systems. So that's one of the, uh, the strategic advantages that we have as a company is to be able to go in and find these types of projects that are un poorly poorly understood or uh, misunderstood and apply new thinking and new geologic approaches to a project that's been known for quite some time. Okay, and, and do you think you've kind of managed to stick with the same strategy from day one? Have you had to, you know, find alternative solutions? Because if I look, you, you said there, you wanted, you chose to be a single asset company. You didn't want to be a portfolio company. And um, there's nothing wrong with it, but some people, you would look at single asset, especially in a uh, you know, country like Peru, and go, well, that's high risk. I need an option of something. I need a get out of jail uh, card option here. So what made you say, well, no, this is the strategy for us? Yeah, and I guess I should clarify that because we look at other assets, but our bar is set really, really high. If we found another project like, um, you know, like Soledad, sure, we'd go after it. Absolutely. Uh, but we, you know, we haven't found that, and that's been that's been the history of me in my career. It's really, really hard to find good projects. It's it's not hard at all to go find a project anywhere, really. I mean, you can find anything, and you can you can talk it up and make it look good. But I'm talking about a project where you can you can come in and start up the drill rig and produce solid results with the drilling. Yeah, you know, time after time after time, and we've done that, and that just that's proof that our our strategy and ability to identify good projects is one of our fundamental strengths of a, as as a management team. Okay, and um, so let's just talk about some of the numbers here, if you don't mind. So, you, how much cash have you got today? Uh, six point six point six million. Okay, and for your needs for now, that'll see you through for how long? Yeah, that'll get us through the 15,000 meter drill program, which we have planned. It's fully planned. It's drilling new targets in a new part of the property that we have not been able to drill yet. So we're well uh, set up financially to get through this next phase of drilling. Right. And, do you, and why do you think that's going to give you everything that you need? If you spend your money, you've got your 15,000 meters of drilling. Why is that going to be good enough for the market here? I'm trying to think, what, what do you think the market needs to hear to be able to fully appreciate and value your business, which it probably isn't right now? Yeah, no, certainly it's not. Um, our, our goal has been to get a resource in around the 10 million ton mark. And the reason we, the reason we came up with that number is that if you have a high quality project of the kind of grades that we're talking about, and this is a copper, gold, silver project, it's really a unique combination of metals it's very high grade in all three elements uh, combined it's it's we get some really really spectacular grades uh, but the you know the, the goal has been to put a, a resource with the kind of grades that we've been drilling in around the 10 million ton mark and if you can hit that in Peru all of the things considered from a mining aspect that should turn into a mine in Peru My, Peru is a mining country it has 
uh, a, a really, really deep pool of skilled underground miners in the country and developers and support for mining. Uh, so that's the kind of project that should be able to take off and run quite quickly in, in a country like Peru. Except for permits. I mean, talk to me about those. You, you said they, they, they don't have a good track record yeah. there. So what's been the problem? Yeah, the problem really is just a, it's a bureauc very bureaucratic uh, process. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a paper-based um, uh, society uh, in general. And, uh, you know, we see that now. It, it's been one of the stumbling blocks in COVID-19 is the fact that they're used to carrying documents around to get stamps and signatures uh, on multiple uh, hierarchical levels. And when you're shut down and working from home, that's that's more difficult. Um, but you know, we've we've navigated through that. We had a very good week last week with regards to uh, the permits, and we're moving into the final stage of the permit this week, which is something that we're getting through that last stage. It took a long time to get to that point. Now we're through that, and we're in the very final stage, which we know to be a, a relatively quick and smooth uh, phase to the final uh, aspect of the perm permitting process. Meaning, what, what sort of timeline are we talking about? For that final stage, they're telling us four weeks. What did they tell you about the last stage? Well, the, the last stage, it, it, they don't tell you anything because uh, one of the aspects about uh, projects in Peru is whether or not you have to go into consulta previa, which is a, uh, a consultation process with local communities. And our the, one of the unique aspects about the northern half of our project is it's all private land, which is great from a from a mining standpoint to have to have private you know land involved. And so our permit that we're getting now does not affect um, directly affect local communities. Therefore, we didn't need to have consulta previa, and that's allowing us to go to this next stage. And, and what they tell us is going, going to be about four weeks. Okay, so you have some degree of confidence about that then sounds like yeah. okay okay so so let's start talking about the pro the projects here because you tell me you're going to do 15,000 meters of drilling i mean how much of the 6.5 does that represent in terms of cash then well it'll be about it'll be about two and a half million okay what are you doing with the rest well uh studies we're doing metallurgical studies we're doing other types of geologic studies we're looking at engineering um we're working on underground access one of the easiest ways we can expand the resources in the future is to drill from underground but that's again that's a that's about a 12 to 14 month permitting process so we're doing the technical work now to see where we'd want to gain underground access to get uh, future drilling platforms at lower levels in these breccia pipes. Okay, and tell me about it. Tell me about the team, um, because I'm obviously you mentioned Doug there. I also recognise John. He's at is Aldebaran and um, Regulus. Is that right? Is that that's correct? Yeah. Right. So he's yeah. kind of what is he advisory or non-exec? What's he's his a director? Role? John's a director. He's a director. Yeah. So so we have. We have five five directors, and three of the directors are geologists. Doug uh, Kerwin, the chairman, uh, John Block's a, a director, along with myself. Um, you know, John has a, a really spectacular track record, um, similar um, in that he started his career with the big major companies, worked all over the world, and then joined the the ranks of the juniors in uh, with Antares. And um, you know, they had a spectacular run at at, at Antares with uh, the Hakira, the deep porphyry discovery at Hakira, and divested that for I believe around 650 million to, to first quantum, and they're on their way to do it again. So John's. Uh, you know, he's he's got the experience of operating in Peru. He's done exactly what our strategy is, which is to take this this asset and bring it to the point that it can be developed into a mine and divest it to, uh, to somebody, you know, to come in and develop it. So we have, you know, in addition to Doug's technical expertise with thermally breccia pipes, we've got John's uh, commercial expertise in being able to navigate those waters and, and divest the project. So we have a very, very strong management team, you know, at the very top. Right, but who's in country managing the process, and you know, are they able to advance it as quickly as you'd want, or is it all pretty much desk research? Yeah, no, it's it's we've got a fully functional team in Peru, uh, general manager, uh, exploration manager of the project, and then you know all of our technical team, 
uh, in social team, in our legal team, everyone's there. So there's no requirement for me to be, I mean, I, I am there a lot and, you know, I'm usually there 10 to 12 times a year uh for a variety of different things i you know i am the ceo but i the geology is so fun i do spend a lot of time uh, working with the team and and we've done some really really innovative things i think on the project in terms of advancing the exploration but you know i have total confidence in our local team to run uh this you know next drill uh program uh, we've already got a drill rig on the property uh the drill roads are already there um, you know, we're, we're pretty much ready to go as soon as we get the permit and get through the COVID-19 uh, aspect of, of what's happening in Peru right now, we, we will be ready to execute. So does that mean, and obviously drill's not turning in with the permit, but um, what are people on site at the moment or are they just in country? Well, that's a great question. We have three people that are on site and they've been on site since March 8th. Okay, we have not been able to rotate them out. Um, we were in transition. We had just completed a geophysical survey and we were in transition and, and, and moving to uh, another stage of, of field work on the project. And we got caught and uh, most of the people you know, were able to get out, but three three guys were still there and they've been there since, since March 8th. And you know, we just haven't had the opportunity to bring them out. Okay, okay. And just, and I do want to get onto the project, I really do. Uh, but I just want to cover off all of these things first. Is So, Peru, you've, you've talked about some of the downside in terms of the administrative component there, but it is geographically very well endowed and there's some very big players already in country. So, what's been your, when you're talking to shareholders or you're going and talking to funders, What's been the pushback that you get about the country? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the permitting issues are well known and, and people people have and, you know, you can talk to any number of juniors and they will they will tell you that even in major companies as well. They will they will echo those those thoughts. Um, you know, there are social um, con there is social conflict in the country of Peru. Mostly it's in, in, it's in parts of Peru where it's traditionally a, an agricultural region and mining has moved into that. So there's there's a, a cultural divide. And, you know, a good example is Las Bombas. If you look at what's happened in Las Bombas for a variety of different reasons. And I was actually at Las Bombas before I came on and, and, and we started up Chicana Copper. But um, so, you know, there are issues. And, and historically in the past decades ago, you know, northern Peru was really the hot spot you know, around Cajamarca and, and the development of several of the projects up there. And that's that's largely, you know, changed over time. The mindset has changed. It's a much more supportive mining community now in that part of the country. So that's that's an issue. We're fortunate in that we're in central Peru. We're in the Ancash province. It's where the Antamina mine is located. Um, it's also where Piarina, just 35 kilometers to the north of our project, is located. So we are right in the heart of mining in Peru and you know I, I, I do complain about the permitting process in Peru but the good thing about Peru is they have a rock-solid mining law it's very well established there's great precedence for it it is a mining country they've been mining uh, you know uh, mines for for over a hundred years and in many of these places in fact the district we're in has been operational for a hundred years so they're you know they're well set up they have a tremendous deep pool of trained uh, mining uh, professionals in the country that are mobile that will go to the sites where you need them uh, to mine. So we're happy to be where we're at. The infrastructure in Ancash is second to none, mainly because Antamina, the largest mine in Peru, is 65 kilometers to the east and Piarina is 35 kilometers to the north. So there's plentiful um, electricity. There's, uh, there's lots of hydro generated electricity in the country. Uh, we're 500 meters to the east of our land position is an operating lead zinc silver mine. So we're already in an established mining district that has operating mines and operating concentrate plants, uh, great uh, road infrastructure and plentiful water. So, you know, this is the kind of project and this is all part of the selection process that we went through. It's all it's all great to go find a, 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 a deposit you know, that looks good at, you know, from a, a grade and ton standpoint, but when you can't get to it or you have to fly a helicopter into it or, 
uh, you know, you don't have the infrastructure to develop it, then you, you've got a much longer time frame that you're looking at as opposed to what we have here. True, true. And what's your relationship um, locally? Because you, you talked about you've got a lot of people in country. Are they local? Are you having to engage with the locals? ESG is a much, much bigger part of the mix these days. How have you engaged mm-hmm. with that with your local community? Yeah, so I mean, to start with, you know, the local communities are are accustomed to mining. Mining is a part of the fabric in Ancash, and, and you do see that. And we've had tremendous uh, support from the local communities, and and we support them. It's it's, it's a mutually beneficial uh, arrangement. There are two small communities immediately adjacent to the project, and then there's a larger town of about. 2,500 people, and I would say that uh, you know our our permanent staff team, most of which is out of Lima, but we have other people that that that, are, that come out of Arequipa or Trujillo. Um, we double the size of that team with local employment, and those local employees uh, serve the function of security staff. They're field technicians. They help us with uh, core processing. Uh, drill road construction and pad construction and that type of thing. So we we do invest a lot in the in the uh, local uh, labor pool in terms of training and development and and providing good solid jobs for those people. Uh, but then there's also a number of benefits that flow to the community, especially during COVID-19. We've been very proactive in in helping the local communities and families with food and with medical supplies and that type of thing. Okay. Okay, interesting. I just think it's a very important um, component to what companies must do in terms of doing good for society. I think that's really, yeah. really important. So, okay, um, let's get on to the project. I guess that's why, we, why we're on this call, right? <laughs> um, so you described it as very good. You, you, you think the numbers are, as, as a polymetallic in terms of the, the copper, gold, silver, are very good. Go on, tell me why you, why you say that. Yeah, well, again, going back to our strategy, you know, one of the ways you never know what the metal prices are going to do over time, right? And really, the ideal project is a project that can make money during the downturn and then absolutely kill it during the during the the the, the up cycles, right? When the metal prices are high, uh, and that that was our focus. We wanted something that was high grade. There's plenty of low grade projects out there, especially low grade uh, copper projects. You can buy them by the dozen, essentially, and we did didn't want anything like that. I mean, low-grade projects tend to have huge footprints, uh, which is, is an environmental and a social concern. Having a high-grade deposit with a smaller footprint uh, is, is a much easier project to envision and move along that path towards development. And then, of course, economically, if you're producing uh, 1% copper and, and 1 to 2 grams gold and 60 grams silver, um, you're able to ride out the metal cycles uh, and still make good money in the in, in the downturn. So that was that was part of our strategy. And you know we don't know where the where the ultimate uh, resource grades will end up. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. But I can tell you right now, with the 30,000 meters that we've drilled to date, about 60% of the value in the mineralized breaches that we've drilled to date sits in gold and silver, and about 40% sits in copper. Which, Even though our copper grade is running around one percent, so I mean that tells you how significant that is, right? It's no, we're not talking about really, really low grade um, uh, uh, additional elements that that come with it. It's you know they're all three significant in terms of the grade. Well, it comes back to your point earlier, and I'm not trying to do your selling for you, but you know, gold and silver are quite topical at the moment. Prices are well. Silver's are going to get there apparently, if, if uh, what I hear is to be believed. But gold's obviously very topical at the moment. Copper not so much. But with great copper grades like that, I guess that's um, that's a nice nice fallback for when when it does pick up again for sure. But I, I think it comes down to so grades is one thing, scales another. Mm-hmm. So you've done thirty thousand meters. You've got another fifteen thousand meters to drill out once you can get back uh, and doing that with with the permit in place. Um, what do you know about what you've got today and what sort of parallels are you trying to draw trying to push into the market about what you think you could have yeah well one of the things we've done is that um we've done very extensive surface exploration and and these breccia pipes are really obvious i mean they stick out of the ground and we've got 23 breccia pipes 
uh, that have been mapped and sampled. We've done geophysics over these breccia pipes. So we have a very, very good template for understanding what these breccia pipes look like at surface and how that transitions into a drilled out uh, breccia pipe. So we've already done that. And, and, and when we look forward like this next round of drilling, it's all directed towards breccia pipes that have not been drilled, that have exceptional characteristics in terms of their endowment with gold and silver in particular. Copper tends to be leached at surface, so you don't see a strong copper uh, signature, but that's typical in this part of uh, Peru. Gold is really the key, and so we really key on that. So we know that uh, the, the breccia pipes we drilled in the past that have similar characteristics have drilled out really well, and we're anticipating that this next round of drilling will have you know similar results and add to the, uh, the, 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 the story that we've developed so far with the 30,000 meters of drilling. Okay, and just just for we've got all uh, skill set, all all abilities and uh, levels of knowledge watching this. So just describe the breccia pipe. You know, typically because you're you're talking about a uh, twenty three of those. They don't all they're not all born equal. So if you just sort of tell people what that is, what they are. Yeah. So just starting with the word breccia. Breccia simply means a a broken rock. So it's 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 fragments of rock and uh, collectively the, they form a body. Uh, our, the, our breccia pipes are vertical, uh, cylindrical type of pipe, pipes, either oval shape or cylindrical. And a unique aspect about these breccia pipes is they get bigger at depth. It's one of the characteristics of tourmaline breccia pipes. And there's a, there's a genetic reason for that, and I won't get into that because it is fairly technical. But it's a great aspect to have is that you start off with a breccia pipe that might be 40 or 50 meters diameter. And as you get deeper, like in, in breccia pipe one, where we've done the most drilling, it changes into a breccia, an oval shaped breccia that's got about a 40 by 70 meter footprint. So it's considerably larger than it is near the surface. And, you know, if, if that continues to happen with all of the breccia pipes, the ones that are strongly mineralized, then as you get deeper, the pipes are getting bigger, you're adding greater tons as you go, as you go at depth. Right. Okay. And clearly you're going to be going underground. So there's a cost to that. Again, what, what sort of examples are there? So I, I just need to sort of understand or get a sense of the economics of, of something like this, because underground is more expensive than open pit clearly. So what, what do you know? Yeah. And again, that kind of goes in with the, the grade profile. So if you have high grade, it allows you, it gives you more options with the mineability aspect. And we've had three different mining engineers weigh in on, on the project. Um, our own, we had a Goldfields mining engineer that was part of the original uh, investment by Goldfields and they continue to monitor the progress and they were very, um, uh, complementary of the approach that we had taken, just the conceptual ideas that we had in terms of using sublevel mining as a mining method on individual breccia pipes. The breccia pipes are close enough. I mean, sometimes, in fact, we found already a blind breccia pipe. That's a breccia pipe that didn't come to surface. It still had 125 meters of rock above it. Um, so it was completely blind. And we were drilling one breccia pipe and went across about a, a 40 meter gap and then went into another breccia pipe right at the very top of it. Um, so we know that those blind breccia pipes exist and that when we say we have 23 at, at surface, the, you know, the, the number of blind breccia pipes, we have no idea yet because we haven't finished the exploration. But if you found one this early in the game, the chances are there's a lot more blind breccia pipes um, that are out there. But the, the other positive aspect from a mineability standpoint is we've got about about uh, five or 600 meters of relief on the property from the valley bottom up to the very top. And, you know, so you've got a mountainside that's going up like this. And that means that you can drift in horizontally at different elevations to get access to these breccia pipes. And then once you get access to one breccia pipe, the next breccia pipe could be as close as 40 meters away. It might be 200 or 250, but there, it's a very tight cluster of, of breccia pipes. So, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to have underground individual mines, sub-level mining on, on multiple breccia pipes interlinked with underground mining infrastructure to connect up and, and, and provide, uh, you know, uh, transportation of your product and that type of thing in a, in a more unified way and ramping up production in that kind of manner. Yeah, that's what I was actually going to ask next. So th thanks thanks for discussing that. 
um, when describing it. Um, you mentioned gold fields there, so I don't think any conversation will be complete if we didn't ask about them again, just for people new to this story. When did they come in? How much did they put in? Why? And what are they doing now? Yeah, so they came in in, in, in May of 2019. Uh, they put $8 million into the company at 51 cents, and we were trading at about 40, 40 cents or whatever. And they were they were quite happy to make that investment at that time. Um, they're very compatible in our view of the project. They love the story about these high grade breccia pipes and the fact that they're vertically extensive and there's multiple breccia pipes and that you could potentially develop an operation on, on those breccia pipes. But they're also very intrigued by the, the upside potential of what's driving these breccia pipes. And, and most people think that, uh, that the breccia pipes are driven by a poor that sits at depth, a much larger type of deposit. In fact, the previous explorers had solely been focused on, on the, the porphyry potential and really kind of ignored the breccia pipe potential. And that was really part of the different strategy that we came in. And that was really Doug's influence. Doug said, you know, the uh, I'll talk about Doug's view of the porphyry in a, in a second, but he, you know, he, he clearly established that we need to focus on these breccia pipes because they're big enough, they're plenty plentiful, they're high grade, and we very likely could develop a nice resource just on the breccia pipes. But so the, the, the porphyry potential is something that that's out there. Not everybody believes in it. Um, Doug doesn't, and most everyone else that's been on the property, including some very considerable porphyry experts, do believe on, in the potential there. So Goldfields, is, is they're excited about that aspect too, but in terms of what they've been doing since then, we, we have a technical panel that, that was developed between Chicana and, and, and uh, Goldfields personnel. They bring a tremendous amount of resource to the table. Uh, if we need a metallurgist, for example, to, to, to come in and start working on a, on a study for us, they'll bring that person in. Their chief geophysicist has been heavily involved in the project, a resource geology, a number of, of different uh, ex, you know, expertise type of specialties that generally a gen junior company doesn't have unless they go out and hire a consultant or whatever. So we have a, a really deep field of technical expertise that we could draw on from Goldfields. Okay. You're not under any pressure for, from them, are you? I mean, eight million bucks, not a lot of money to them. You're waiting for permits. It's inconsequential or do you get that phone call once a month going, what's going on? You know, that, that's a great question because, um, you know, we do get a lot of pressure from shareholders in general about, you know, the timing and why is it taking so long and what are you doing and that type of thing. But, you know, Goldfields, I mean, obviously they want to see the project move along, but they already operate in Peru and they know what it's like. They know that things take time and that you have to, you sometimes have to be patient and, 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 and work through the through the process so we've we've gotten no pressure from them they really have been a tremendous partner for us in terms of providing capital providing technical uh, uh, expertise and 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 other aspects i mean they jumped in and participated in our our local uh, program to provide uh, medical supplies to the local communities. You know, they just saw the opportunity and we invited them. We said, you know, we can do this on our own, but if you want, um, you know, you're welcome to join us. And they, they jumped right in there. So they're providing a thousand test kits for COVID-19. We're providing medical equipment and, and a number of other things that they've asked for. So it's been a great partnership in all aspects. Okay. Yeah, good company. For sure. Um, so just in terms of wrapping it up a bit, your share price has been in slow decline for like about the past two years. You know why people are worried about permitting, the ability to get permitting. You've told me today it's about four weeks away, potentially, about that, there or thereabouts. Um, are you nervous that when you do get this permit, you don't get this uptick because people are bored of this story, they've moved on to other things? Well, you know, so the permit's one thing and then the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation is another. And, and that's really critical for us. You know, we, we want to get back to work as soon as we can. Everyone does, obviously, but we're going to do that in a really responsible way. The communities are super important to us. Uh, it's, 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 it's the long term that we're really concerned about. And mining is a long term industry. It's, it's not a quick industry, right? And, you know, a lot of people get hung up on what's the copper price today or the gold price or whatever. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, this project could be in production in five years, you know, and that's, the metal price that really matters, of course, is when you're producing. But 
but it's a long-term industry and you need the community support uh, all the way, you know, not just at the start of a project or during the exploration stage, but all, all the way through it. So, you know, that, that is foremost in our mind is, is starting up in a responsible way so that we don't uh, put the, uh, the community at any risk um, or our employees, you know, or our contractors. So that's, that's really critical for us. Okay, and what do you think your shareholders are thinking? Obviously, you know it's a long-term game, but you've got shareholders have been sitting on this um, for for a while. Do you think are you worried about any kind of overhang when things do start moving up? Well, I I, I would like to acknowledge those shareholders because they have you know they have uh, stuck with us and uh, they you know even though they sure they would have liked this story to have played out within eighteen or twenty four months when we started and we had a great start obviously um, we got on the ground we had a we had an existing drill permit that was one of the the great things when we auctioned the property but then we immediately recognized that the the mineral deposit was much larger than the current land position that we had initially optioned so we tripled that land position over time and in tripling that land position then you have to basically start over the permitting process to get access to that new land it doesn't just go with your expanded mineral rights so that that was the reason we had to go back to square one and, and start the permitting process but it was for good reason right we've we've gone from a thousand hectares to three thousand hectares we've captured the geologic opportunity which is really the most critical thing in a project that you get the land that you need and we were able to go do that we did a deal with Barrick on some of their concessions in the south so Barrick is also a partner in this project and we we acquired some key land in the middle of the concessions uh where that's where we'll be drilling next and some of the some of the most exciting targets on the property have yet to be drilled and that that'll be part of this next 15,000 meters of drilling okay and what in terms of um talking to people new to this story why chicana why not every other kind of gold story which is you know being pushed out there at the moment what's so special about you guys well i think the the commodity mix is really important you know um we we have a lot of copper on the project but we also have the precious metals too so it, it's a unique opportunity to get exposed to uh the it's polymetallic but polymetallic it's used for any time there's more than a couple of metals they say it's polymetallic but Copper, gold, and silver, uh, with, we've, we've hit over five kilograms of silver in our drilling. We've hit over 42 uh, grams gold in our drilling, and we've hit over 10% copper in our drilling. So there are some really exceptional grades in this deposit, and we're just scratching the surface so far. So getting exposed to those three commodities. The upside potential is enormous. We've never seen the bottom of a breccia pipe yet, even though we have high grade copper silver intercepts at 740 meters in one of the breccia pipes. We've never even seen the high temperature alteration that tells us we're getting close to that intrusive source at depth. We've got 23 breccia pipes. We've already found a blind one. The breccia pipes are getting bigger at depth. There is the potential for finding a mineralized intrusion at depth. Really, the upside potential is enormous. So if you're looking at a junior company that's got a market cap of, like us around 15 or 17 million, uh, you know, trading in the 15 to 20 cent, uh, it's a phenomenal investment opportunity in my mind. Yes, we we were over a dollar at one point. Um, and it's been a it's been a long, you know, painful journey to get to where we're at now. But uh, for, for new investors to come in and look at this and see, we've already made a discovery. The greatest risk in investing in exploration junior companies is that they'll never make a discovery. 99% of them don't make a discovery or a discovery that's of any merit. And we've already demonstrated that these breccia pipes have technical merit. Now we're going to be evaluating the economic merit of that when we get a resource put together but you know tell me where you can go and invest in a company that's already made a discovery and invest at you know one of the lowest price points that their stock chart has had at the on the cusp of getting that drill permit and coming out of COVID-19 with the drill rig turning that's that's a pretty exciting opportunity to me. David thank you very much for today nice run through first time I've heard that story first time we've spoken um Thank you for being so uh, honest about what you think you've got there. Um, you've got some exciting news coming up in the next four, five, six weeks. Pick up the phone and give us a call when you've, uh, when you've got the news. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the opportunity. We really appreciate it.